Welcome to GFA TV. We are thrilled to launch our very first show, Global Vision. Global Vision is our long form program released on the first Friday of every month and geared towards specific topics of interest to the international guitar community. We have 12 excellent episodes in the works for our first season, along with a few bonus offerings. We'll explore a new topic in depth and with experts from around the world in each and every episode. Topics like how to build a guitar studio, technical lineage, career development, how to host an online concert in this day and age, interviews with artists, and repertoire diversity. Be sure to like and subscribe and to tune in each month to see what's on offer from GFA TV's Global Vision. Kicking things off with our first episode on health and wellness is our host Michael Kagan in conversation with Gerald Harsher. Enjoy. The current moment truly feels like living history, and we as artists need to remember that we're sensitive by nature. And it's this sort of great tension of opposites where our sensitivity is both our greatest strength and weakness. Many of us find our greatest refuge in our instrument, but many of us still are playing injured, afraid, anxious, or limited. My heart goes out to all of us that we find a way to honor that inner child artist. Today we're talking about self-care, body mapping, and how emotions can affect our neural pathways in playing. With all of us sitting at computers now more than ever, it's so important that we check in with the quality of our movement so we don't bring excessive tension into our playing, and also that we check in with our emotions so we can tend to the emotions of the music that we're making. Today's conversation is with my dear friend and one of the leading experts in body mapping and movement education, Gerald Harsher. Gerald is a performing guitarist, a somatics educator, and an author who teaches body mapping to musicians who want to be free from injury, pain, and limitation. Gerald has taught body mapping courses at top university music programs, including Yale University School of Music, the New England Conservatory, and the Berklee College of Music. His publications include Body Mapping for Better Playing in Berkeley Today, Whole Arms, Healthy Hands, and Soundboard, and his forthcoming book, What Every Guitarist Needs to Know About the Body, A Guitarist's Guide to Technical Freedom, will provide practical body mapping information so guitarists everywhere may improve their performance and break free of painful limitation. Gerald holds his Master of Music in Guitar Performance from the Yale University School of Music, and he's a licensed body mapping educator. For more information, please visit thepoiseguitarist.com. Hello, Gerald, and welcome to GFA TV. Thank you, Michael. It's great to be here. Wonderful to have GFA TV. Could you introduce us to the field of somatics and how does this knowledge help cultivate the right condition for practice and performance? Musicians move for a living and that's a fact. Nobody out there has ever played a note on the guitar without a movement. And if you don't think that you move for a living, then that's where the work needs to start. Uh, a lot of musicians don't think that they move for a living. If you ask a room full of musicians, do you move for a living? Uh, maybe the, the room has some dancers in there and some actors in there as well, you know, and, and of course the actors and the dancers would consider that question, do you move for a living to be a really stupid question. But a lot of the musicians may not be so clear about that. So it's really the first, the first way of, of mapping yourself um, is that as a musician, as a guitarist, uh, you are a mover. You you move to play and it, and it then begins to bring focus on how you move because where a movement will produce a sound, the quality of movement is important to be considering and be aware of with regard to what quality of sound uh, you want to produce. The intention, attention, and commitment that comes from that self map, not only as an artist, but as a mover for a living. So um, yeah, that, that, that sense of self concept really plays a role in, in our quality yeah. of movement. So the body maps in the brain, 
govern movement. And these are actual neuronal maps. They're actual nerve pathways on the cortical surface of the brain in the sensory area and also in the motor area of the brain. When Barbara Conable, who you know is one of the great pioneers in the field of somatics with a training and background and worldwide reputation as a uh, Alexander Technique teacher, uh, she and her uh, former husband, Bill Conable, who's a musician, a fine cellist, um, really developed body mapping uh, for musicians. And Barbara's original book, How to Learn the Alexander Technique, was essentially a textbook. It's a textbook that's used all over the world. But now uh, the next book that Barbara wrote was a wonderful little printer uh, in body mapping uh, called What Every Musician Needs to Know About the Body. I would recommend it to every um, everyone uh, who's interested in this topic. Um, it's a good start. Specific to our craft um, and our success uh, is embracing that we move for a living uh, and also to go further to put all of our musical uh, practice and performance, our training, whether it's institutional training of musicians coming along or uh, just one's own personal approach to their practice, that they you know, put their music training on a secure somatic foundation. What that will require uh, is systematic training in three areas. One is the area of movement, uh, and body mapping is probably the most efficient way to train movement. The systematic training of attention. Attention is generally mistrained. We're taught to concentrate hard and that causes tensions. And then also systematic training of the senses. Turns out the very sense that tells us about our movement, the kinesthetic sense, is not actually on the list of five senses that all of us were taught in grade school, unfortunately. Bouncing a couple ideas off that, I thought it was very interesting that, well, one, just to talk about Barbara's book for a moment, um, if you haven't if, if you haven't checked it out yet, it's sort of like, uh, for me, it's like Winnie the Pooh by A.A. A. Milne, where it's like deceptively deep. You, you read it and like there's a lot of humor and wit to it. And it, um, it's easy to be dismissive of it. But then when you read it again, you're like, oh my gosh, this is, this is profound. So I would just encourage everybody, if you do pull the trigger and you, and you want to look at the book, approach it again and again and again because i've every time that i've done it i've gotten more from it and you know i also think it's interesting because uh you know both julian and myself you know had to cope with our injury maybe around 26 or 27 which is kind of kind of young to be dealing with um at least i feel it was young to be dealing with some of these injuries so gerald we we we've kind of laid the groundwork for somatics I wonder now if we can kind of go into the second part of the question, which is how does, how does this knowledge help cultivate the right condition for practice and performance? So first of all, you know, in order to um, be able to perceive your movement and, and just perceive it really clearly, you'll need to claim for yourself a whole and integrated body awareness. And that would mean that you would need to be able to feel your whole body um, and that would also presume that one knows what the physical senses are that would enable one to feel their whole body. Basic idea, you know, is to be able to uh, experience one's whole skin. You might try that, you know, as we're just talking about the tactile senses, just think for a moment about your whole skin everywhere, exterior to you. And in order for us to play our best, we really need to be including all of it. Uh, because when we narrow our attention to just the parts of ourselves that directly play the instrument and, and exclude everything else, uh, then we don't do as well. And inclusive attention is where we really have this expansive view of the body, the whole body, and also the space uh, that we're in, which is really important when we're performing. The next sense that we need to be mapping out, though, is the kinesthetic sense and also the sense organs that are involved. Um, so the kinesthetic sense is uh, what tells us about our movement, but the sense organs are not in the skin. It's deeper than the skin. It's in the muscles and the connective tissue embedded in the muscles and connective tissue. It tells us about our movement. It tells us about our quality of movement. It tells us if we're free, feel free, moving freely. Uh, it tells us if we're feeling tension somewhere that we need to respond to in order to uh, be able to go forward without that tension or learn how 
to play without that tension over time. So kinesthetic sense is, is, is part of this pair, the tactile kinesthetic pair that gives you the physical sense uh, of your whole body. The final thing that you, that is, you know, as a minimum that we need is to include our emotions. We need to be able to be aware of, of our emotions as well as our, our thoughts um, and, um, uh, and intentions. And, and with that, we have uh, the right condition for practice and performance. You've been teaching online since 2009, and a lot of our friends and colleagues right now are in Zoom calls for many hours a day, and our students too. So I, I think it's important that we have, obviously we all, we all need self-care in our life, but I think these sort of body mapping, constructive rest, and these other kind of awakening of the tactile and kinesthetic senses are especially important right now in the advent of, of all this screen time that we have here. Um, so I'll have you talk about that a little bit more and how that maybe helps you transition without having all the baggage of screen time like this and, it, and kind of the other faux pas that can, that can happen. The important um, piece to, to see here that makes the difference between inclusive attention and um, concentration is that inclusive attention is, as it says, it's inclusive versus concentration is actually actively trying to exclude things. It's trying to narrow the attention, concentrate hard on something, takes a great deal of effort, is very tiring, uh, and also causes tension. So the way that I practice using my attention that makes it so that I can teach uh, several hours and not feel tense and uncomfortable um, has a lot to do with this, this piece about attention. So here I'm, you know, I'll just tell you what's included here in my gestalt, right? What's, what's included in my consciousness right now? Michael, you're in my focus. You're here on the screen. You are the focus and this is important. Just like with contact points, uh, you know, with our flesh and nail, we need to train that and, and we need to have focus in order to be able to train that and all those details of the stroke and all the importance of the specifics of our technique. At the same time, the periphery in your environment there, which I can see on the screen, is also included. It's not my focus, but it's radiating out. And also the periphery in my environment here, outside of my screen, I can see to my right, to my left, above me, there's, there's uh, below. I'm including all of this and I actively make sure that that whole panoramic vision, that whole periphery uh, remains in my awareness. And I catch myself if for some reason uh, I'm looking at somebody's hands and I'm saying, hmm, I don't know if he's his contact point is very good. And I start to like zone in visually and staring hard at it. Well, I have to pull out of that at some point and, and realize, okay, yeah, I'm starting to get some uh, neck tensions uh, as a result, eyes are getting fixed head spine is getting fixed, that'll create neck tension as it spreads into the arms. Um, we can't afford that as players, you know, when we do our teaching, we need to be able to remain free and take really good care of ourselves so that later on when we practice or the next day when we practice, uh, we're not carrying around uh, this burden of, of tensions that were acquired uh, in, our, in, our, in our teaching. So, so in this situation, I wanna invite people just with your own screen to, uh, I guess maybe you're looking at me right now, um, or Michael, or us both, pick something, and something really narrow. Maybe, you know, decide to, you know, focus on the nose of the person that you're looking at here, either Michael or Gerald, and, and just stare, like block everything out and just stare narrowly. And just notice what that starts to do in your body. Uh, generally speaking, here I go, I'm going to start, you know, really concentrating and narrowing down and get really zoned in here. My head starts to pull forward and I start to narrow in my body, it creates tensions. All of that will interfere with playing. Now, contrast that with, okay, look at the, the person's nose again, but just seeing that as uh, the focus that you're using, but the rest of the face is part of the periphery and the rest of the space that they're in is the periphery and also the space that you're in and you include all of that and notice if you don't feel different, better even, uh, because muscles in your body, your kinesthetic sense is telling you, okay, we like that better. That's freer. There's a reason by the way 
for this capability that we have to narrow our attention and get really concentrated because it'll save your life if there's a bear 10 feet away from you gnarling its teeth looking really threatening well you need to be able to concentrate and it does not matter what's going on in the periphery the only thing that matters in terms of your survival is to track every movement uh, that's going on from this threat to, to your life and limb in that, in that case I'm, I'm thinking yeah. of the uh, the Barbara Fredrickson book as well too where she talks about uh, there was a study basically where they would show a panel these you know, these positive images, let's say it's a beautiful mountain scene or something like that. And the peripheral activity was really engaged. And then they would show maybe a more horrific site, car accident or something like that. And the peripheral act- activity diminished. So there seems to be something about our worldview too that happens when we invite our peripherals to happen. I think we literally see more around us, both in the the literal sense and then maybe in a metaphorical sense too, whether that's solutions for our playing or some other area that we're we're struggling with. It also has to do with our feeling of well-being, you know, if we feel safe, if our brain feels safe, uh, then we do, we're able to take in more of life if we're feeling threatened. Um, and that could be a, a, a difficult passage in a piece of music, it can actually create a kind of psychological threat that the brain doesn't recognize uh, as being any different than, you know, an actual physical threat like a like a bear. Brain doesn't tell the difference. We're operating on this old software uh, in our brain that has not been updated. Yeah, because so many of us concentrate. You know, like we we we're, we're taught. You know, we hear that a lot in in our in our lessons and in our instruction, or maybe we say that to our students a lot too. And we realize it's. I'm thinking of Feldenkrais's article, uh, Learning to Learn, here. It's like when you try to do nicely and you try to concentrate, again, it almost like uh, is self-limiting in that sense. That's exactly what we're saying is that concentration is limiting, especially uh, to uh, coordination and, and, and movement. It's, it's absolutely uh, tension causing and, and limiting. It's important to realize one other piece is that it's not just about having this kind of peripheral awareness, that's an important part. But it's also important to realize that there is absolutely a very clear focus, but there's differences between the focus uh, that one may experience in concentration and the focus that we're talking about. Concentration is very singular and it doesn't move well. It doesn't move around well. And as musicians, we need to be able to have our, our focus clear and bright but also able to fluidly move from here to there. If we're playing chamber music or if we're playing a concerto, we need to be able to communicate visually, take cues, um, and so on and so forth. So our, our abil- uh, ability to have visual inclusiveness is, is, is essential to what we do. We need to be able to have our focus move to our left hand when the left hand is about to make this big shift that's difficult, and so we have that. Maybe the right hand, if it's something particularly challenging there. It needs to be able to move around bright and clear um, and, and and at the same time able to fluidly move wherever the priority uh, for the attention needs to be. And it's not always visual. Sometimes the, 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 the attentional focus is really centered around something tactile. You know, from the audience's perspective, they don't feel like they're watching somebody who's in a bubble uh, playing music at them. Uh, but instead they feel a part of it. They feel that there is this uh, inclusiveness of attention that, it, that, that envelops the whole room. I think the next piece now is maybe something that you, I know for a fact that you do every day, which is some floor, pr- floor practice with constructive rest. Um, and constructive rest, uh, which uh, involves laying down on the floor, uh, knees bent, so that's why we call it semi-supine. If the, knee, if the legs were straight out, it would be fully supine, but with the knees bent, feet on, flat on the floor, um, a little book under the head, uh, then you're in a position that already will be free. Now you're not having to support yourself the way that you have to in sitting in a chair or standing. Um, and this will help you, uh, uh, before going to the guitar to practice, find uh, some freedom uh, for yourself. Meanwhile, claiming all the awareness that you'll need and the emotional awareness that you'll need in practicing. So how about I do that? I'll just um, give you a little bit of a, a feel. Um, 
I still use my uh, music theory book from college. It's about the right height. <laughs> and uh, it's still useful, everybody. <laughs> yeah, exactly. So with regard to the book that you choose, of course, if you if the book is too too thick, then your head will be like that. We want the head to be at neutral. We, the book is not thick enough. Uh, it, your head may be tilted back. So you have to kind of use your feeling, your felt sense to, to notice uh, where you are in terms of balancing the head. Do you have like a rough estimate, uh, Gerald, like an inch and a half or like what? Like okay, For me, that, that book is about, uh, about an inch, three quarters of an inch or something like that. This is Cindy Supine. Oh, and also arms are important. You don't want to pull them in tightly. Invite your arms to be able to, uh, elbows to move out away from your body comfortably. And then I like to place my hands usually about here or maybe uh, sometimes there. And this is this is this is Cindy Supine, and this is where constructive rest happens. And here you'll have a chance to just sit with yourself and um, and uh, explore the tactile sensations of the whole body, explore the whole body kinesthetically, feeling all of that, and then your emotions, and then uh, spending a bit of time with that, and that'll enable you to to be in the right condition to begin your practice. Um, when you get up, it's good to kind of roll to your side, like so. And you could actually keep going in circles. What do you think, like four to 10 minutes or so kind of doing that? I mean, sometimes if you're not, you know, we don't want to just set the timer and just call it a day. It's, it's really about, am I, am I awakening my senses? Am I awakening my peripheral activity? If you feel that, that um, you have the time, you could take more time if you're really enjoying it and getting a lot uh, a lot out of it. Um, you could you could give yourself more time. Uh, if you don't have as much time on any given day, you could plop down for uh, just a very little little moment and, and uh, just kind of connect with it. If you have a regular practice of this, which is what we're advising, is that you do this as part of your, this is the beginning of your practice, essentially, it's what we're saying before going to the guitar. Um, you build that in. And you can, you can, um, you know, you could spend as much or a little time um, as, as you can or, or, or feel the need to on any given, uh, on any given day. I, I think we're starting to move into um, some real kind of practical ways of looking at this. And I know many of our friends and colleagues have a, a museum of support devices, which I think kind of implies that there's some pain going on. So I wonder if we can talk about some common body mapping errors or symptoms such as back orientation or the prominent second joint of the thumb. I don't want to make somebody self-conscious, which affects their dexterity, which affect, which makes them more self-conscious and we create this negative feedback loop here. So I'm wondering if you can talk about some of these areas just gently and encourage people to, to not freak out if they see anything that we describe, but to just explore it with curiosity and you know, self-care, I guess. A lot of the mapping errors that people have with will, will be with regard to uh, joints. There'll be joints missing in one's conception. The joints are there. They exist in that body, in, that, in, the, in everyone's body. Uh, but if the, if the person's brain doesn't actually have it in their map, then they're not going to be using uh, that joint and won't be getting all the advantages and benefits uh, from the use of that joint. And we can use some examples here in a second. So, but I just wanted to mention that nobody needs to freak out if you discover a mismap. Um, you'll work on it and, and, and do it kind of behind the scenes. Um, you'll bring it to the instrument, but not with a lot of intense playing at first. You'll just maybe bring it into a stroke. Say you're correcting the map of your thumb or something like that. Um, you'll obviously at some point, you know, you'll do work away from the instrument. You'll do work um, then later on quietly at the instrument, just kind of bringing it into your strokes gradually and it'll become a part of your, your technique. The body map is the, essentially is the uh, context for your technique. Um, your technique will improve as your movement improves uh, when you discover a mismap misconception of your body and you correct it, you'll move better and you'll move more comfortably. And would you say that the, um, the, the body almost intuitively knows if, if it's a better movement? Oh yeah. So it's, it's, whenever you're moving according to the way your body is actually designed uh, and you think 
there's a congruence between how you think of your body and its actual design, then the movement is smooth, it's free of tension, um, and your brain will readily want that and choose that, and it'll be very easy to learn it that way. So you wanted some examples. We were gonna look at some examples here. The place where the head meets the spine. Uh, very important because what Alexander figured out is that uh, the neck, freeing the neck, freeing the neck muscles, when he's referring to the neck, he's referring to neck muscles. Freeing the neck muscles is key to freeing all of you uh, it's really essential for playing. But in order to free the neck muscles and truly uh, have freedom there, we need to be uh, mapping the joint between the head and the spine accurately. Now, most people, uh, common misconceptions that people have is that the, the, the meeting place of the head with the spine, uh, and I'll ask people, I'll say, so where do you think of your head meeting your spine? And most people will bring their hand back here but that's the back part of the spine, and that's the nerve housing half of the spine. The spine, which is actually meeting uh, the skull, uh, is really more toward the center, and also that meeting place is toward the center. So if you point your fingers in at about ear lobe level toward the center and then just nod a little bit, you're going to be feeling a clear uh, kind of movement. Excellent, Michael. That's great. <laughs> Versus if somebody's thinking of it back here, it'll have a different kind of movement to it. And that'll be uh, less coordinated. It'll affect the arms. It'll affect playing. Um, I'm going to use my, my uh, friend Sebastian here for a second to illustrate this. We have um, Sebastian's head. Not a real person, by the way. This is just a, a good plastic uh, replica, very accurate, uh, but not, a, not, a, not anybody that you knew. <laughs> um, so the, the meeting point, um, and I'm going to take the jaw off here, which I can do. Sebastian does not mind. I will give it back to him later. But, you know, when we're balancing the head, it's the head. Uh, the jaw is an appendage to the head. It's not a part of the head. So we want to get good balance of the head because we'll play better that way and we'll move better in all of our gesturing and everything. So uh, we need to be thinking of just the head, uh, not with the jaw as part of the head, but the jaw as being the fifth appendage. And this is where, if you see these condyles right here, this is the, the, the location of where the head is meeting the spine. So this whole bony uh, bottom portion of the spine is called the occiput. And these are the upper condyles, which seat right down onto the lower condyles at the top vertebra of the spine. And as you see, it's in between the ears. Getting a little closer to home, uh, since obviously we play the guitar with our arms, um, and, and so it's important to, to know what we're talking about when we're talking about our arms. Now, generally speaking, I'll ask people right from the start, you know, you know could you take one hand over to uh, the opposite arm and just touch everything that you think of as arm? A lot of times I'll see a person start here and they'll go like so and then they'll stop here. Now, a lot of people watching are going to be thinking, well, that's what I would do. So that's common, most common um, kind of, of, of uh, map of the arm. But it doesn't uh, include the wrist and it doesn't include the fingers and the thumb. In other words, it doesn't include the hand as part of the arm. That's a problem. If we want the hand to be connected to the arm, which we do, we do best that way. Um, connected to its support, connected to all the micro movements that the arm uh, has that's involved in our playing technique. Um, it needs to be connected. And if we don't think of the arm, the hand as being a part of the arm, uh, then we just don't do as well. Um, so what I invite people to do is, you know, obviously we think of this portion of the arm as the lower arm. The wrist and the fingers is the lower, lower arm. Now, Generally speaking, I always tend to find that whenever the lower, lower arm is not included in the map of the arm, neither is the upper, upper arm. That means that this part of the arm structure, which is the collarbone, you see Sebastian back here, 
So in terms of the arm structure, we have the collarbones, this upper upper arm structure, the collarbones, and then also so the collarbones, and then also in the back, both uh, arms, upper arm, or arm structure, include the structure of the shoulder blades or the scapula. And, and might someone have, you know, upper back pain if they were like not mapping that area and that that those muscles weren't as free? Could that be a, a symptom of not having just the concept in, in their awareness? Absolutely. Body map contains the information of structure, function and also size. So the function piece of things uh, refers to movement. And that means that we're now talking about joints. So now we're talking about. Uh, we move at joints and so it's important to have accurate mapping of all the joints in other words we need to include all the joints uh, and we also need to have all the functions of the joints mapped you know what what kinds of movements are, are available uh, or what types of movements are available at each of the joints and so again i'd ask that simple question you know could you please touch uh, the joints of the arm and sometimes people get, you know, if they've mapped their hand as part of it, they'll get into every joint of the fingers, which is great. I love that. Um, but generally, I'm looking for the major joints of the arm, which would be the wrist. Um, notice that when I'm going to the wrist, I'm not going to where the wrist watch goes at the lower portion of the lower arm. I'm actually going to where the wrist bones actually are, which is out in here. That's an important area of, of deep exploration. Uh, of body mapping is getting into the uh, all aspects of the mapping of the wrist, which is extremely helpful for playing and refined to playing. Uh, the elbow uh, needs to be in the map um, and usually is, and then people will uh, map their shoulder joint. Oftentimes they map it here, but it's not there. It's actually under here. Little details like that we get into. What's often missing in people's maps is the joint between the collarbone and the breastbone. There's a, it's called the sternoclavicular joint. It's the sternum and the clavicle where they meet, which is right here. And you'll see it with Sebastian right there. So there's one for each, each arm. And what this means, in, you know, kind of getting back to your mentioning, Michael, of, of tensions, and would there be tensions associated with some of these um, arm mismappings? And certainly if one doesn't map this joint, then they're not gonna, they're not gonna have movement or think of movement occurring here. Uh, so they're gonna miss out on a lot of them kinds of movements. Uh, this is bolted down, so I can't take it forward uh, at all, but this collarbone will help you uh, if you need you know, this, this additional bit of moving on forward. You can... If we were displacing the string and we only think here, we're forgetting that we have this humongous structure that can yeah. deliver into the string, and it's, it's powerful, you know? Yeah. Um, the functions of the shoulder joint alone, which are not just the ability to move this way and out and in and forward and back, but also include rotation. Now, a lot of people don't have that function in their map of shoulder joint, but this is a very important movement just to be able to bring your arm comfortably uh, to the strings in the right hand, to be able to bring uh, your fingers there. We'll have a little bit different kind of external rotation, but this needs to be really free. Rotation needs to be very free and it can't be very free if that function isn't really in one's map. And also if the location of the shoulder joint is not accurate, mapping the shoulder joint this high versus where it really is, the beginning of the shoulder joint would be under arm right in here. You can see that there's several inches between this mismapped, commonly mismapped location of the shoulder joint and the actual location that begins under here. Um, that makes a big difference in terms of comfort of all of the movements of the shoulder joint, but uh, you know, also this, this rotation piece as well. Would you like to move to the sit bones a little bit more or just whatever you think is the next best sequence of kind of common errors? I know for me the, the sit bones was a, a huge discovery. So whatever you think is best though. Let's finish maybe maybe one more um, detail, you know, part of the detailed map of the arm uh, with looking at the thumb. One of the things that, that uh, I oftentimes will refer to as the perfect storm of mismaps, uh, and you know, to this point, especially since Aaron Shear published his uh, learning the classic guitar uh, method back in I think around 1990, so it's been out for 30 years, and so the word is out uh, that there is a, a joint back here 
where the thumb meets uh, the wrist. And I think most people nowadays uh, know about that. Um, no shame if you don't, uh, but this is an important area to explore um, for everyone. And so what, uh, I mean, I'm a big fan of Pujol's work, but I will tell you that if you look closely, that Pujol actually mismapped the thumb in that method. Uh, he mapped it as just this. And that is the map that some people will have, and they're gonna be limited uh, greatly by that. Mapping the thumb as just this actually represents a mismapping of all three categories. There's a mismapping of structure, there's a mismapping of function, and there's also a mismapping of size. Uh, first off, we'll just start with the size. Obviously, a thumb that's thought of as, as this uh, long is not nearly as long as a thumb that's thought of as that long, and that will have very real impact on plank. Um, in terms of the function part, uh, that refers to the joints again. And so people who are thinking the thumb is just this are really only mapping two joints, this one and this one. Um, and so that has very real impact on movement as all the body maps uh, do. If the map is accurate, you'll be moving better than uh, your colleague whose map is not. The map, the structural um, this map in this case is that there's a missing bony segment. So we have a tip segment, we have this middle segment, and if you're only thinking the thumb is this, then all you're mapping are two bony segments. This metacarpal is a bony segment as well, and that needs that structure needs to be included as well. So it's not only about what uh, Mr. Shearer uh, was talking about with mapping this joint, but also equally important is to map that structure because that structure is actually moving uh, in playing. And that makes a difference to think not only of the joint, but also of the structure and also this joint moving the whole thumb. So there are details that, you know, moving at this joint, you get not only this movement, but also this movement, which means that you can move downward toward the string or inward toward the string and also uh, to avoid the next string when you plot. So these are important parts of one's map uh, that becomes available once the, this is in the map, this joint is in the map, and the two functions, uh, type of movements that are available there. The other joints don't allow for those, that range of movements, but this double saddle joint here enables both this kind of motion and also this sort of motion. And so when we use a kind of elliptical motion to pluck the string, that's using all of those functions. Won't happen very well if, the map, if it's not in the map. I think it would be a great gift to talk a little bit about dugout position in the legs. I think that's a, um, it's a quick thing to do for our self-learners out there that may not be able to take, take up um, the whole course on just yet for whatever reason. Yeah, so um, first I'm gonna, uh, I was recommend that, you know, especially if you're playing when, when seated, you know, as, as we do with classical guitar, uh, that you find balance in sitting. And so the important thing here is um, to have an accurate map of the, of the hip joints, uh, and uh, which is, I feel like I'm kind of glazing over that a little bit, but that's the essential thing that matters with people who are feeling uncomfortable, say with the footstool. Uh, that's a movement that's primarily about centers upon the movement of the hip joint. If the map of the hip joint, the location of the hip joint is off in some way, uh, then there's gonna be discomfort uh, happening, which, you know, let's face it, this, this goes to the limit, for the most part, near the limit of the range of the hip joint. And so to do that well, uh, which is entirely uh, possible for people, is to map this joint accurately, right in here, it's not up here. You know, people think their legs are meeting up here. It's not. It's much lower. Uh, anyway, more detail on that with the course uh, and also information from Barbara's book. You'll be able to find it there as well to get really clear about where it is. You can see it here with Sebastian too. It's not up here. The joint is right there. And so uh, being able to bring the leg up onto a footstool, many players worldwide are absolutely comfortable. We're talking Marco Tamayo, Joaquin. Lurch, Manuel Buaco, David Russell, Jorge Caballero, there's a lot, lot, lot of great players out there have spent their whole career using a footstool. So the footstool is not an evil. Um, the reason why 
people are not comfortable with foot stools is because there's something going on with the map of where the leg meets the pelvis. Once you have the accurate mapping of your hip joints and you realize that the legs are meeting the pelvis at the side, not in the front, the legs don't come under the pelvis, that it's mapping the meeting place between the leg of the leg bone and the femur, meeting the side facing pelvic bones with their side facing sockets at the side. And so now my pelvis is able to move within my legs and I can comfortably come uh, into this, what some folks will recognize, what they, baseball players do in the dugout, this dugout position, um, and just rock well forward and then just simply rock back. And you will feel at the base of the pelvis, you'll feel those rockers with the ischial tuberosities, the sit bones, it's all those words we've used to describe, to name this. Um, you'll feel it engaged with the chair. It's a great movement, you'll use it in playing, you'll use this in playing, all of these movements. But it's good to know where, where home is. It's good to know where neutral is. And so this is me at neutral. Uh, I can curl, I can rotate, I can do all kinds of spinal motions, but it's good to know where home is so that I can come back to it again and again. Yeah. Well, Jerry, since you're right next to Sebastian, would you just point? Uh, so just showing that we're not, again, we're not on our femur there. We're, we're... It's part of the pelvis, not separate from the pelvis. It's part of the pelvis. And that's important to come on to that support uh, so that all of the torso included in the arms uh, receive support from below and from gain access to the support provided by the chair. So and again, the, the mantra there is you don't sit on your legs, you sit on your rockers. Yeah, you don't sit on your legs for sure. Yeah, not sitting on the legs. The legs are uh, meeting the pelvis uh, at a point that's higher uh, than the rockers are. And so the rockers actually drop down and meet the chair. You'll see that I really only use the front portion of the chair. I don't need the rest of it. I just come on to the portion of the chair just enough to get my rockers onto it. And that gains for me the support that I need. We covered a lot of different topics today. And I would like for, for someone out there that would like to get started today to kind of have like kind of a bullet point flow chart, whatever you want to call it, of all the areas that we explored. You know, we talked about constructive rest, peripheral activity palpating arms, maybe give someone a small routine based on the um, procedures we talked about today. You know, it starts off on the floor in constructive rest, cultivating a whole and integrated body awareness. It then goes into standing where we uh, work with what we call the mapping of the skeletal core and the six places of balance. Um, that's in order to be able to sit in balance, one needs to have balance in standing. So. Balance is then carried into the chair with one particular maneuver dugout position, which we had looked at, uh, to enable one to find the all important uh, balance of the hip joints and sitting, which one can move uh, in and out of. I was watching uh, Horowitz playing the piano recently, and I was just amazed at how uh, rocked forward. He had clearly a really wonderful mapping of his hip joints. So there's there's no mandate that one stay at neutral, but it's important to know where neutral is so that when you come forward, it's a choice uh, and you could come back and find uh, neutral again, or you could move back. Guitarists also, you know, we curl at our instrument and the head leading the spine uh, and curling is also something that you can practice away from the instrument and, and then uh, have that very, uh, refined version of curling available to you in your in your playing. You have courses where you spend just an hour on the arm structure alone. So I mean, we're, we're going very, very quick. So, you know, we admire everyone listening for keeping up here. Uh, on guitar.study.com, this is Julian Lodge, uh, a project or a, a website that Julian Lodge and his management company have put together. I'm a part of this, uh, the teaching, the faculty, um, there and I'm teaching what every guitarist needs to know about the body course uh, there at guitarstudy.com. Uh, so keep an eye out for that. Um, uh, you can always uh, email me at 
gerald at thepoisedguitarist.com uh, and I can put you on a list so you'll be notified for that. A few years ago, I, I got really curious, uh, you know, to like start to interview some of my friends and colleagues and, um, and you know, I, I went to uh, Scott Tennant and uh, met with him down in New York in his hotel room when they were on tour, uh, Jorge Caballero, Cecilio Pereira, and Jason Vio, Elliot Fisk, right? Thank yeah, Elliot and um, uh, just a, a whole bunch of people. I'm not uh, Dennis uh, Azabajic, uh, Jason Vio, um, and a number of players. And it, what's their map? What's the Virtuosos map? And that's what I call it, the Virtuosos map project. I started to inquire. I wanted to find out uh, about the accuracy. And I, and I was interested to see, was there something that they all had in common? This was something that I learned, uh, that every one of them had a really strong sense of how important the legs are. And that was the thing that I didn't really anticipate learning, but that was the biggest takeaway. It's like, yeah, they are all really, really aware of the importance of the leg. So anyway, you know, in terms of self-care, being able to discover where there are misconceptions and correct them and learn how to correct them, is going to go a long way to ha helping a guitarist be able to have a full career uh, that lasts a lifetime. I mean, let's face it, we hope to play for our whole lives, and this is the kind of information that really gives longevity. Great. Gerald, I, I think we've discussed so many valuable topics today, so I really hope our listeners out there can get started and give themselves permission to take care of themselves. Cause I think there is, um, you know, sometimes the hardest person to love is ourselves, you know, and I can kind of feel myself kind of welling up as I, as I say that, cause I know all the times that I haven't done that for, for myself. So I just, you know, I I'm available. I'm sure Gerald can, you can email him please. If you need some more resources or something, um, it made you more curious. I'd love to be able to help, um, stem you or push you in the right direction with things. So please don't hesitate. I hope you don't mind me um, if putting you on that too, but please, please get a hold of us if you have any more questions. And Gerald, thank you so much for your, your time today. It was, it was awesome. My pleasure, Michael, and thank you. And also thanks to the GFA for all the good work that they do.